Now, I have to be honest. A decent portion of what I'm about to tell you about comes mostly by way of watching movies. Movies about California and Italy and France and places that they make wine. So in no way would I say that I am an expert on the topic of vines and vine dressing, but there are some things that I have learned. And one of them is this, that the work of being a vine dresser is laborious and difficult work. Each vine, every branch that comes off of it, must be tended to individually with great care and concern. And the vine dresser not only is looking at that branch and what it is growing then, but how it affects the growth of the whole vine overall. Every piece is considered not just for the fruit that it is growing, but for the potential fruit that it could grow. Our gospel this morning, Jesus takes up this image of the vine and the vine dresser. He tells us that he is the central vine, the true vine, the one that comes up out of the ground from which all other branches grow, the one which is connected to the soil, bringing forth all of the nutrients and sustenance that the branches need. It's the way that these things are delivered. And with Jesus as the vine, God is the vine dresser, the one who carefully tends to and prunes these individual branches that come off of this central vine. And then we, those who follow Christ, we are these little branches connected to the vine, looking to it as our source, while also being the final stop, the place where the fruit and the flowers grow from. So listening to this story, some of Jesus' words may have been surprising. We hear at the beginning that the fruitless branches are pruned, those which grow nothing. And this is probably not surprising. Even with little knowledge of plants and horticulture, it makes sense that things that are dead and dying would be cut off and burned. But also, those branches that are bearing fruit, we are told they will be pruned as well so that they may bear more fruit. Because even when a branch that is producing is cut back, the energy and the things that it takes are able to re-centralize. It's easier to get from the central source to these branches. And this creates and produces even more growth, fruit that is more nutritious, a plant that is stronger and eventually more bountiful. And when pruning a branch like this, the vine dresser chooses future growth over current fruits. He knows that some patience is required, but that by pulling back, getting these branches closer to the true vine, the potential for the future is much greater than what they have currently at that time. So whether it is a dead vine or a producing branch, at some point, all branches need to be cut back and burned. Jesus calls us in this text to dwell more closely with him, to abide in him, to look to him for our sustenance and survival. And this call that we hear from him reaches towards a central Christian truth, that our fruitfulness comes not only from our will and desires, but instead through the growth out of Jesus, that with the judgment and guidance of God, we are act, God acting as the vine dresser, we are able to be fruitful. It's from Jesus that we receive our sustenance, and the closer we remain to him, the more fruitful we will be. So the primary message of this short gospel passage is clear. When we hold close in our hearts the word of Jesus, when we abide in him, we can trust the work of the vine dresser. And while the process of pruning or being pruned may be difficult, the eternal good, the greater good which is being pursued, is achieved. And then in our own lives, we are able to glorify the Father, bearing fruit and being disciples of Jesus. And when we experience this growth or this pruning in our lives, we see the Holy Spirit at play. It guides us and directs us, bringing to our awareness opportunities to teach about the gospel, not just with our words, but in our actions. In this analogy, the indwelling of Jesus in us and we in him then goes on to shape the whole of Christian community. The church, which has been carried on for over 2,000 years, 
started in the beginning with people telling other people about Jesus, by listening to the Holy Spirit, by allowing themselves to be pruned by God. And then the fruits that they bring forth are even greater because they're holding fast to Jesus by knowing his word and living his word. And we are a continuation of this chain, more fruits of this same vine, disciples of Christ who glorify the Father. And in our story from the Acts of the Apostles, we see a great example of this sort of abiding in Jesus. The disciple Philip, who would have been with Jesus when he said these words, is one of our main characters in this lesson from Acts. He would have known this teaching, and he followed it in his life. Philip lived out his life after the death of Jesus, going around teaching and telling others about him. And Jesus at the beginning of this story, or Philip at the beginning of this story, we are told, listens to an angel of the Lord. And this angel comes and he tells Philip to go on a road that would likely have been deserted or not well tra traveled, the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. He follows the Spirit's guide and goes to this road, and that is where he encounters the eunuch from Ethiopia, this man who has many questions, which Philip is well suited to answer. In the early days of the budding church, soon after Jesus' death, the way that people understood who were God's people and who were not was being shaped and changed because of what Jesus had said and done. Jesus preached about all people coming to him, both Jews and Gentiles, and all people being equal in the eyes of God, which was upending this tradition that the Israelites were God's chosen special people. And while under Judaism, others could come to the faith, they never quite held the same status as God's chosen people. And it took many years for Christianity, as we see and understand it today, to come into being as this religion that is fully separate from Judaism. In the beginning, these things were co-mingled as they sorted everything out. So Philip as he's following the direction of the angel, meets this eunuch who has departed the temple and is riding in his chariot. We're told that he was Ethiopian, meaning a foreigner from a northern land, and that he worked in the queen's court. From his circumstances, we understand that he is wealthy enough to have a chariot, educated enough to read Greek, and devout enough to come to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship. His passion is shown in that while riding along the road, he's reading the words of the prophet Isaiah out loud. Because he was a eunuch, he would not have been able to be circumcised, and this was the ritual necessary for, to become a proselyte or a full convert to Judaism. So he would have been considered a God-fearer or only partially part of the faith. Regardless of his title, however, his zeal for the Lord shines forth. He listens, Philip listens, when the Spirit tells him to come alongside this man and hears him reading the prophet Isaiah. Philip asks him if he understands what he's reading, and the eunuch asks his first question of Philip, how can I unless someone guides me? He then asks Philip to, guide, to join him in his chariot so that he may guide him. And in this small act, we learn something important about this man. He was a foreign dignitary inviting an unknown preacher walking along the road, a disciple of Jesus, into his chariot with him. This crossing of culture and status would have been noteworthy, if not scandalous, at the time. So just as we see that Philip is reaching out to somebody that may not have been part of the faith already in the same way, this eunuch is also reaching out to Philip, who would have not have been of the same status. At this point, the eunuch asks his second question, about whom does this prophet speak? He wants to know if Isaiah is speaking about himself or someone else. As a eunuch, he would have known about the feelings of being rejected and desolate. So Philip takes this opportunity to share with him the gospel. He tells him about the scriptures, the good news about Jesus, which are fulfilling these ancient prophecies. He inclu including this passage from Isaiah, which the eunuch was already reading. As they speak together and travel, 
this man comes to understand who Jesus is and what his life and death mean. And they come across a body of water, and the eunuch asks his third question of Philip, what prevents me from being baptized? And theoretically, a legalistic consideration of this question could have raised a few concerns. This man lived abroad. He was physically separated from the land of Israel. He was a eunuch, failing to meet the purity code. He served in the the courts of a foreign queen and therefore was loyal to the wrong sovereign. But Philip, abiding in the spirit and abiding in the words of Jesus, knew that none of these things should actually prevent this man from being baptized. What Philip saw when he looked at this man was someone who was looking towards Jesus, seeking him as the true vine, A man who was more concerned with looking towards his spiritual source than concerning himself with the outward religious rituals and rules which may have otherwise disqualified him. So despite these hurdles which the eunuch would have previously faced, he continued to be a man that studied scripture and traveled traveled in order to worship the Lord. So in very different ways in these two men, both the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip are examples of what it looks like to abide in Jesus and in his word. Philip listens to the Spirit, allowing him to be guided so that this chance encounter with a stranger turns into a divine appointment. He does not judge him by his differences, but recognizes their common faith and that they are of one community with Jesus. At the same time, the eunuch invites Philip into his carriage and into his life, recognizing as well that the things they shared held more importance over the differences that could have otherwise defined them. He's willing to ask questions so that he may better understand Scripture and to know Jesus, and finally to be baptized into the body of Christ. And while Philip and the eunuch were living in a very different world than we are today— Christianity and the church have formed and grown into something very different. Society and the world look different, and we no longer ride in chariots. But there's still a lot to learn from these models of this Christian life and these men. Because regardless of the circumstances, we are called in the same way to renew our lives in Jesus. We see the example here which we can all follow as, uh, as they turn their focus inwards, towards their relationship with Jesus, choosing to abide in him and in his word, trusting the spirit to guide them. These people are willing to ask questions and willing to share with one another what they know and what they have experienced in Jesus. And they, like us, may not always feel able to answer all of the questions or know what questions to ask, But these two men are willing to walk alongside one another, even a stranger, so that they may both come to know Jesus better. They share about the true vine, the one from whom they are nourished and sustained, trusting and holding close to Jesus, knowing that God, as he works in our lives, both by our growth and when pruning, God is working with the Spirit whom we are able to follow so that those we encounter will depart our interaction and go on their way rejoicing. Through seasons of joy and bounty and seasons of hardship and despair, the one who himself was led to the slaughter like a sheep rose from the dead three days later. He brought for us eternal life for all, not just those who could live to the rules and expectations of the old covenant, but bringing in a new covenant in which all people are called and welcomed to Jesus. For all those to look to him as a true vine, the one who will sustain and nurture them. Amen.